Good to go. Once again, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. I'm Al Vasso, and I'm here with none other than tinfoil hat wearing Ian Juby. And I love the hat, Ian, by the way. Love the pot. Love the pot. No, thank so you. we're going to drone on a little bit here for, you know, to give everybody a chance to join in as we know there are a lot of people who are planning on joining tonight, uh, looking at some of the numbers that uh, Ian threw at me just moments ago. So the first order of business, in case there's a technical issue and the live stream drops, give us a few minutes and we'll get it up and running. But you want to keep checking rumble.com forward slash user forward slash Ian Juby forward slash live. So in case that feed drops, don't fret, just get back on rumble.com forward slash user forward slash Ian Juby forward slash live. And we'll get you back up and running. And that live stream should take you to the latest live stream and we'll be ready to go again. Now, it also needs to be mentioned that the views expressed in this live stream are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Core Audible. Little disclaimer. And by the way, Ian, speaking of hats and you, and how are things? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's been, it's been, oh my goodness, it's been a while, a few months. But, but I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to this. That's great. That's great. And also, by the way, please know that we'll be going to the chats on Bubble quite a bit tonight. So please keep the comments respectful. And if you wish to support the channel and future live streams like this one, Rumble has a YouTube equivalent of Super Chats. If you know anything about the YouTube uh, Super Chats, Rumble has the equivalent called Super Chats. Now, Rumble Rants, where you can give a tip and get your comment and question highlighted. You know, if it's your first time, let's say, giving a tip, for example, you have to fill out a payment info section. But the larger the tip, the longer your comment stays highlighted and at the top of the chats. So if you want to consider giving a Rumble Super Chat, now is the time you can chime in there. Now, normally, YouTube takes about 30%, and that's their cut. But, and Rumble usually takes about 20%. But apparently for the rest of 2023, which is phenomenal because we're still only in May, 100% of the tips given through Rumble Rants goes directly to the creator. So click on the dollar sign, and if you want to make a Rumble Rant, get your question or comment highlighted, and we'll do our best to give priority to the rest. What do you think? Well, give me one second. Thanks everyone for coming, by the way. Uh, we're juggling a lot here. My camera died literally 25 minutes. My old faithful camera that's like 12 years old uh, died about 20 minute, 25 minutes before we started the live stream. So I'm still uh, juggling a lot of stuff <laughs> before we uh, were able to do anything. Um, give me one second. So I well, hope you'll- I'll tell you what. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the support. So the support encourages the production of other kind of future live streams on controversial topics, like oh, yes. one of them, the alleged global oh, warming. Yes. yes. Yeah, we love the global warming. One. Yes. Oh, so yeah. we've got mathematician Alan Montgomery, and he's in line to join us for one of them. Yeah, one I didn't tell him that yet. No, I just didn't. <laughs> you want to stick around for that? It's going to be a good one. Mm -hmm. So and I got it, a question for you. Mm -hmm. All right. So what about chemtrails? Are we touching oh, on chemtrails? So we probably won't today, but but okay. we should. Um, that, that'll be hopefully one of the upcoming podcasts. I hadn't talked to you about this yet either because we've both been going crazy. And, Just a uh, little bit. Yeah, so I... I uh, uh, is this where the event is okay i'm just checking the comments um but yes chemtrails we should we should deal that with that as well in another podcast also um now you remember uh our podcast we did on bill c11 which uh, sadly c11 has now come into effect um I, I, you're, you're going to get my blood boiling, so don't bring that topic up. But uh, regardless, uh, we were supposed to have Bill Gibbons in uh, for the next podcast. And of course, everything fell apart. I went on the road for three months. You were you started a new job and Bill just disappeared off the planet. So I haven't talked to Bill about this yet either. But Bill is, uh, this thing's hot. One second. Um, <laughs> it was hot out there today, dude. It was like 27 degrees Celsius, man. It's like 24 in here now. I'm almost sweating. But anyway, uh, so Bill, uh, of course, you and I 
will know this already, and many of the viewers will already know this as well. Uh, Bill is, uh, he's gone into the Congos of Africa multiple times looking for a creature they call Mokili and Bembi. And um, it sure sounds like a sauropod type dinosaur. Uh, still alive today in the Congos of Africa, much smaller than what we find in the fossil record, which lines up and makes sense if you know anything about the fossil record. Well, in uh, we made that we mentioned this possible podcast at the end of the B Bill C eleven emergency podcast, and we mentioned we were going to hopefully have uh, Bill Gibbons on, and um, one of the comments was this: uh, "Oh, you probably." Yeah, you probably can't see this. Sorry, folks, we're working with we're working through Zoom now because Zoom and OBS decided to duke it out and Zoom won. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I'll, let me see if I can. I'll screen share. Give me one second. I'm going to screen share so Al can see this because Al will want to see this. Uh, so crotchety. This was in the comments after the Bill C11 crotchety old grudge. I love that name. Uh, along with the Congo dragon, you need to investigate the duckbill swamp mos monsters of Australia, reported by the Australian Aboriginals. No joke, seriously. I'm not even kidding either. Just serious. Just saying. Uh, so this is uh, quite interesting. Um, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Duckbill. Uh, this this is the first I've heard of it. Have you heard anything about this before? No, this is the first time I've heard. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that up with Bill if we can manage to lasso him. I'm gonna be in Alberta in a couple of weeks, so maybe I'll track him down and uh, try and uh, do the old uh, Alberta steer steer wrestling <laughs> thing and see if I can uh, rope him into something. Um, Definitely a follow up. Yes, yes. Uh, two, 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 two. Okay, so that was all we had about that. And I am going to mention this again. I already mentioned it. In case something goes wrong and we lose connection, please just be patient with us. We will try and get back online. Just go to this link here. Uh, whoops. Go to this link, rumble.com slash users slash Ian Juby, my, all, my name, all one word, slash live. And that will take you to whatever stream is running at that point in time. And uh, because I know we had a we had a writers room uh, workshop that we did a couple a uh, couple weeks ago was was fantastic, um, and seven minutes in, I'm explaining what we're all going to do, and we got like a lot of people in the room, and my computer blue screened, uh, just blue screen of death. So if something bad happens, just uh, we'll try and get back online ASAP, and that's how you find us and uh also again the the for whatever reason R rumble's doing this promotion now so super chats uh not super chats the uh the rumble rants uh 100 of that goes to uh the production of the podcast rumble isn't even taking a cut so al i want to ask you why you're here why, why we're doing this now, why, why are we doing this? Uh, I'll, you want me to start or do you want to start? Well, either or, I could just touch base uh, quickly. I can tell you honestly that uh, through my social media feeds, I'm being inundated with people talking about flat earth, flat versus low, yep. uh, you know, showing all kinds of experiments and observations, and home experiments and people out in the field doing them and so on. And it's become such a hot topic that I think in our discussions, you and I, even, we decided, hey, let's let's go for it. Let's see where uh, where this takes us. Yeah, and and that's that's exactly what happened on my end too. And protect in particular the past month. I mean, I've I've been dealing with the topic sort of indirectly uh, for mm -hmm. well years. I mean, it must have been twelve or thirteen years ago. I was on Paul Arthur's show on Miracle Channel here, and right. uh, and I warned him in advance. I said, you watch. When we go to the phones, someone will bring up the flat earth. Sure enough, <laughs> just, just bright as rain, there it was. Incredible. Um, Incredible. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's been around for a while and a growing topic. And, and um, unfortunately, no matter, how we, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, we are going to confront somebody's worldview somewhere, whether we support it or refute it, doesn't matter. So 
I'm, I'm not going to apologize for that. I am going to apologize that I make people feel uncomfortable uh, because it does not matter what we, whether we support it or refute it. Someone's worldview is going to get, uh, get confronted. And I had to get my worldview confronted a few times. We'll probably have to get it confronted a few more times before I leave Earth. Um, and it's, it's a good thing. It's not comfortable. And I want to I wanna come to everybody like really humble about this. I'm not, um, I'm not arrogant about this. I'm not calling the flat earthers stupid. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, uh, I think the reason they're even here is because they are smart and they are asking questions. And I want to support that, if anything. Uh, for me personally, anyway, um, it's just, uh, for instance, uh, and somebody brought it up in the chats already. Uh, let's see if it will comment. Oh, yes, there it is right there. Breaking Babylon. Thanks for coming, by the way, Breaking Babylon. Breaking Babylon had, oh, uh, Breaking Babylon had asked, um, said, just show us the curve and that's all you need to show us. Well, I, I don't think that's good enough, honestly. Um, I think, I, I think what I want to do is I would like you to see the curve for yourself. That's what I want. Um, and so what we're going to do, we're not just going to show you the curve. I'm going to show you how you can see the curve for yourself. Uh, I think that's much, much better. Um, and I noticed you also shared this, this video on YouTube, which, um, a friend of mine on Facebook had already shared with me. I wasn't, I won't play it. Um, and I, I don't want to because it's just Neil deGrasse Tyson. And frankly, he was being rather condescending, to be honest. I'm not a big fan of deGrasse Tyson to begin with. And to have him basically belittling the flat earthers like he was, that, first of all, that just, that turns me off. I'm not, that doesn't make me a happy camper at all. Um, so for that reason alone, I wouldn't play his video. Um, but then this video in particular, all it did was it took a uh, DeGrasse Tyson quote, which was very belittling, and just put it on a loop. Oh, it's perfectly flat, perfectly flat, perfect. It, it, it was pointless, right? So, I mean, no offense. It's just I wouldn't play that video for multiple reasons, one of them being this guy was belittling my friends. Yes, I disagree with the flat earth, but these are my friends he's talking about here. Um, you know, I will show some respect. I mean, come on. <laughs> They're asking legit Absolutely. questions. So, and you know, some of it is it comes down to just a mutual respect, whether or not you agree on a worldview or uh, whatever the case may be, or whatever the side of the coin you're on. It really just comes down to respect, mutual respect. And I think whether we agree or we disagree, as long as we agree to disagree and do it amicably, then you know it's it's great debate and it's great discussion. Mm -hmm. And the, another point that, uh, so one of the people, uh, a young lady that, uh, I've known since she was, she was like five years old, <laughs> Keisha, uh, she had been asking me about this because some friends of her had been, of hers had been, you know, talking about the flat earth and whatnot. And she, she asked me my views and opinions on it and I shared them and she just wrote back. She was saying, you know, I think a lot of pe these people are, uh, really skeptical now, which, which is a good thing. It's a really good thing, um, and especially because of what's gone on the past three years in particular, where nobody trusts the government, any government funded body, scientists, nobody trusts any of these people anymore. And frankly, I don't blame them. Um, so it's I think that has also been a major spurn <laughs> in the growth of this movement with just people asking questions. And I think they're good questions. I think we should answer them as best we can. I mean, there's some that I'm sure will come up that we just, well, we won't have answers for. But I'm also looking forward to sharing with you some of the ones that I do have, uh, including some experiments we did just yesterday. Uh, but anyway, uh, and on that note, uh, a friend of mine wrote in. Now, uh, uh, so <laughs> the reaction we've gotten from this already, even before we started, I mean, I got within hours of posting Monday, uh, I got accused of being a Freemason and a deceiver. And uh, I don't think anybody called me a member of the Illuminati, though. Wait a minute. So, isn't that Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson tactics? Probably. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I hear you. You know what? I get the same thing. It's, it's funny how a worldview or an opinion 
<laughs> dictates to others their view on you. And then once they pass that judgment, it's, it's hard to, to come back from it, I guess. So what we do is, as, uh, for myself as a Christian man, is I kind of just brush it off the old shoulder and I just keep going forward. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and they did bring up a good, a good point, which we'll get to. Um, but my, one of the people that wrote in, uh, again, I, I just, even the comments and questions that came up before we even started. So one of them, I, he made this point with regards to, cause he is also skeptical of the government, government bodies and all this. So all these people skeptical of NASA, Hey, I'm okay with that. I don't blame them. Um, but he did bring up a very good question, which it's a rhetorical question. I will bring it up. I have a question. If the government created the spherical earth to cover up the flat earth, what would be the benefit or point? And I think it's a very good question. Um, now, my Bible says the government is going to openly behead people in the streets, people like me, Christians in particular. Um, so, yeah, I don't trust our government, especially our current government. Um, and I probably never will. But that doesn't mean that they're always lying, or even if they are lying, there may be some truth in there. So, you know, you got to kind of evaluate it. So the way I'm going to approach this today, I know, I know you've got a bunch of stuff on the, the biblical perspective there, Al. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, but, um, how I'm going to do this, uh, first of all, I'm going to be going to the chats as much as possible. Yeah, I know. I, we keep seeing color bars on your feed, Ian. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, Breaking Babylon keeps asking, uh, just show us the curve, which means no one has ever seen the curve. Um, actually, and, and like I said, uh, I think we should do better than that. It's not just I'm going to show you the curve. I want to show you how you can see the curve for yourself. For, uh, and so that brings me back to what I was saying was I'm going to constantly try and refer to the questions and comments. Um, but also I'm going to be approaching this and focusing a lot on home science. So this is stuff you can do at home. And, uh, and especially if you, if you don't mind spending like a couple hundred bucks, <laughs> you're going to find out it's pretty incredible what you could do from home and um, so when in all these questions uh, that, whoops, where'd it go? And all these questions that came up, um, everyone was asking, um, do you have any videos on the flat earth? Which I did not. And so th this was the only one I had, which was uh, the Crevo rant number 271, the flat earth. And all this dealt with, was whoops i got the wrong screen up here ah sorry guys i'm juggling too much here. There the historical society of britain what's that was it historical society of britain yes they have that as their number one myth uh on their list of historical myths and it was this <laughs> idea that columbus you know there was uh, everybody was paranoid columbus was going to sail off the edge of the earth and um uh, because they, everybody thought the earth was flat at that point at that time, um, which was not at all the case. That is complete fiction. And so that, that's all that video de dealt with was because everyone was saying, um, oh, you creationists are just like the flat earthers, and just like the flat earthers in Columbus's day, right? Uh, which is totally, it's complete fiction. That's the only video I had. It didn't deal with any of the science of, the alleged flat earth or the alleged globe earth. And so that's one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing today. Uh, okay, so that brings me to one of the comments that was posted a few days ago when I posted that thumbnail of a flat earth. In fact, I think I've got it up here. Nope. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I posted a thumbnail, this one. So can you see that, L? Probably not, eh? Okay. I'll have to do a screen share. Screen share. I'll share it with you. Oh, there I, we go. Because I share. So go. they were they were objecting and saying that nobody believes this model. Actually, I know several people who uh, flat earthers who believe this kind of model. Now they may object to this part. 
the the under part because you know nobody knows and that's fair um what i was looking at in particular was the layout of the continents and the approximate shape of the flat earth that's what i was looking at in particular now um they are certainly welcome to object and say that this is a misrepresentation the problem is there are plenty of flat earthers who believe this very model and so we run into uh, a bit of a dilemma in that there are multiple models of the flat earth so it does not matter what i post someone will object and say that's not what i believe and totally i i get it i acknowledge that i acknowledge there's multiple flat earth models and so uh i kind of wanted to start there and discuss briefly about what the flat earth models are and what they are not and if we can let's go to a bit of history first with let me close this down eratosthenes do you remember him i certainly do not okay. in person but i do remember no, no. Him. okay uh a little before my time he well no there's a no rational person trusts the government. What? <laughs> no one has ever seen the curve from Earth or an airplane. I disagree. I'm going to show you. But that's okay. Uh, thanks for coming out and thanks for the comment. So let's take a look at Eratosthenes for a second. Because uh, this is going to become really important in just a second. And give me a second to screen share it with Al so Al gets to see it as well. So... 300 BC, uh, Eratosthenes, uh, he was one of these math geeks, which I am not, uh, but he just loved numbers and loved math and loved geometry. He noticed that there was, you know, the shadow on the sundial was at an angle. And of course, that's how sundials work, right? Uh, so he noticed there was a sundial on, or there was a shadow on the sundial that was on an angle from the sun's rays. But he also found that, so he was in Alexandria. He also learned that over in Syene was a well that during noon at the summer solstice, there was no shadow in the bottom of the well. So what this meant was the light from the sun was going straight down the well. There was no shadow while there was a shadow over here in Alexandria. So what he did is he measured the angle of the shadow and it was about 7.12 degrees is the number he got. So now, look at this. You've got a triangle. So you got a triangle. You can triangulate. And also, in his particular case, because they, uh, they were looking at that time, uh, they would see things like eclipses, solar and lunar eclipses. And in both cases, the shadow falling either on the moon or the earth was round. So, uh, so they, Eratosthenes, you know, leave the debate aside for a second. He firmly believed both were spheres because it did not matter what angle they were at. It was always a round shadow around, right? So his question was, okay, how big is the earth? How big is the sphere? And so that's where, that's how he approached this. And I'm going to share my screen again with you. So he approached this as on a curve. So he figured, oh, okay, so we've got 7.12 degrees over here and zero degrees over here. And he, of course, if he divides uh, 360 degree, the full circle by 7.12 degrees, you get 50.56 times. So he concluded if you measure the distance from Alexandria to Syene and multiply that distance by 50.56 times, you will get the circumference of the Earth. And so he did that. So this is kind of the layout to give you an idea of, of how it works. Um, the, the Eratosthenes experiment works on a flat earth. Ah, yes, thank you. We're going to get to that, actually. Uh, I agree. It does work. Uh, but that leads to a very, very significant point, which we're going to make in just a second. So he, he was, uh, this is ancient Greece, so they were measuring in stadia. And uh, so the, the me actual measurement of stadia has been lost. 
uh, but they figure it's between 155 and 160 meters. So we're going to go with that, with those numbers. So that would place the circumference of the Earth in his day between 39,184 and 40,448 kilometers. Now, our modern day claim is that the Earth's circumference is 40,075 kilometers. That's, that's a pretty, pretty good little estimate there for some Greek guy 300 BC uh, who just loved his numbers, <laughs> right? Um, so, now, as Breaking Babylon pointed out, he is correct. You can explain this within the Flat Earth model as well. So, let's take a look at it from the Flat Earth perspective, because this is very important. So, what this does now is, in a Flat Earth, this now makes a triangle, a right-angle triangle. We know this is about 5,000 stadia, and the reason we know that, this is kind of fascinating. There was guys whose job it was to measure long distances. And that, that was their profession. That was the, what they did for a living. So these people actually measured out the distance between Alexandria and Syene. And that's how he got this number. So we know that the angle here is 7.12 degrees. We know that the bottom of the triangle is 5,000 stadia wide. We know that this is a right angle. So it's pretty simple math, just simple triangulation. So that would mean we can now calculate the altitude of the sun because we can calculate this side of the triangle. So that would mean the sun would be 40,028 stadia at altitude. So roughly uh, between 6,200 and 6,400 kilometers in elevation or 3,877 to just a little over 4,000 miles. Now, those numbers are seriously, seriously important for a couple of reasons. Um, so when we take a look in the, uh, in the writings of the Flat Earth uh, advocates, uh, for example, okay, so there's our number that we came up with, which you guys can do this all at home. Uh, Samuel Burley Ro Robotham. So he, he was going under the pen name Parallax when he wrote Zetetic Astronomy back in 1881. And he wrote, hence, it is demonstrable that the distance of the sun over that part of the earth to which it is vertical is only 700 statute miles. So in other words, he is, according to his math, the sun is only 700 miles at altitude. And Eric Dubai, Dubai or Dubai, uh, in, in writing the Flat Earth Conspiracy in 2014, he estimated 3,000 miles altitude. Now, I'm acceptable, I'm, I'm okay with any one of those numbers you want to use. Uh, I personally don't care. The, mo the only point I want to make here is that all of these numbers are exceedingly small compared to what NASA or the Globe Earth theorists claim, which is that the sun is about 93 million miles away. So, the difference between, let's go with 3,000 miles, just because that's a good number, um, and compare that with 93 million miles. We're talking a difference of a factor of 31,000 times. So all I'm saying is that you just have to get close. You, you have such, an, a, such a monstrous margin of error here that there's a number of experiments you could do and all you have to do is get close you you know you could be off by by four or five hundred percent on your numbers and still be able to determine whether the earth is flat or a, or a sphere so let's take a look at that now um okay one second let me go to the comments okay i don't see any new comments uh okay so Okay, my point there being the flat earth, the flat earth theorists don't even have to agree on the altitude of the sun. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, if you guys could chime in in the, in the chats, please, uh, those of you who are uh, flat earth believers, even, you know, if, would that, is that number fair, uh, say 3,000 miles? Is that, is that an okay number? Uh, or do you want to make it, you know, 
four times that much. I don't care. Uh, but just, you know, is, is that an okay number to work with? And are you okay with... Just, just to chime in real quickly, and I think yep. the consensus that I'm hearing as I do more research and listen to more flat earthers is they hover around the 3,000. Less than the four, even though that's, you know, marginal or whatever, but I'm hearing 3,000, 3,200. Uh, but let's give them 3,000 to 4,000. It seems to be the predominating uh, consensus among flat earthers from my perspective, from my research. Now, again, if they want to chime in on the uh, on the chats, I think that would be great. We can get their point of view directly from them. Yeah, and uh, I see that uh, Breaking Babylon agrees. That's fair. Um, one second here. I have lost my images. I've got like 15 different programs open right now. <laughs> here we go. Okay, this is the one. Oh, just before we get to that, I'm going to remind yes. everybody, once again, if it moves the feed, uh, there's no, no no worries, no time to fret. Just join us again on rumble.com uh, slash user slash Ian Juby slash live, and it'll take you right back to the most uh, recent chat. Thank you very much. We got okay, we to keep reminding that because some people are joining. Thank you. I'm glad you remembered. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through a few different models because um, the one, the a couple of people on Gab objected when I used this image, which really I wasn't trying to make a statement with this, um, but but they did have a point which I have to agree with, and that is you know for some some of the flat Earth advocates will not like this model. They will say adamantly this does not represent what I believe, and I, I'm fair with that. Uh, I'm okay with that. Just understand where I'm coming from in that. Um, there's going to be a lot of different models that people like or dislike. So what I'm going to do, I'll, sh I'll show you is a bunch of different ones, different models. This one is actually straight off the Flat Earth Society website. So this is the model they have. Uh, they just steered clear of the, uh, of what's underneath. And, and that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but so I'll number these. This is number one and try and decide which one you think most uh, most accurately represents your view, basically. And just remember, there will be people who disagree, um, but I want to accurately represent is what I want to do. So there's number two. That's off the Flat Earth website. This one, I think everyone would object to. Look at the continents, the way they're laid out. I forget about what's going on underneath, um, but this is just another example, which I think they would all object to. I would as well. I don't think that accurately represents the flat earth at all. Um, that's number, th was that number three? I think it was number three. Eh? Okay. Number four, um, this one includes the, the Rakia firmament from Genesis 1-6. And um, this will this will sound like I'm trying to dodge the topic, guys, but I'm actually not. What I want to do is I want to ask you guys a question. I know some people will, some flat earth advocates will believe in the dome, but I would contend the dome is not a critical part of the flat earth model. Uh, so would, would you agree with that or would you disagree? If you disagree, why? Uh, see, my views on the Rakia dome are unconventional, <laughs> to say the least. Um, now, Dr. Russ Humphreys, for example, he, um, Dr. Russ Humphreys, uh, in his book on the white hole cosmology, he discussed the firmament quite extensively. And I don't believe this, um, but he argued very compellingly that this solid water, this solid dome made out of water was on the outside of the universe, basically, is what he would contend. And I, he had some very compelling arguments. I don't believe that, but all I'm saying is I could be wrong. <laughs> he might be right. Um, personally, I, I think the, the dome is no longer there, that it was there until the time of the flood. And personally, that's what I think. But even Dr. Carl Baugh, who was the guy who put me onto that model, even he has kind of steered away from that model now, right? 
Yeah, sorry about my camera, guys. Uh, my one camera died, and I didn't have a chance to test this one before anything. So I frantically put it up in a hurry. Uh, uh, one, one point of um, one point of make here, there's actually another model that I've come across, and it's... Uh-oh. Al has frozen. Speaking of the frozen dome... <laughs> Oh, that's too bad. I wanted to hear his thoughts, too. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. There we go. Am I back? Yes. Uh, it interrupted right. your mid-thought, and I wanted to hear what your thoughts okay. were. All right, so my thought is uh, there's another model that's picking up steam in the Flat Earth movement. Mm -hmm. And this is one that I'm seeing more and more of and spoken of more frequently. And it's that there is more land beyond the ice wall. So the oh, ice wall is the not end of it. Yeah, Trattoria, or I can't remember the name of it, Terra, Terra or something. Anyway, uh, that there's more land and uh, more civilizations beyond the ice wall. Uh, with perhaps, some are saying it's one dome covering everything. Uh, other, other flat earthers are saying there's multiple domes, one that covers what we can see right up to the ice wall, and then a, a secondary dome that covers beyond that the, the other territories. So it... The models change quite frequently, and this is part of questioning their their own hypothesis, right? Right. It's, right. it's always developing something new. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that out there. I was looking at the models that you presented and that you showed on the screen, and there is actually another one picking up steam that I thought I wanted okay. to Okay, interesting. The listeners and the viewers. Right, right, okay. So, and, and um, so those of you in the chats, I'm just looking at the chats again. Um, uh, have you guys heard any of what Al was sharing? I'd never heard this before. That's a new one to me. Um, so uh, that's it. Anyway, re regardless, just let us know if you've heard that before. Okay, CW Prez has heard of it. Okay, interesting. Uh, the models do change, but we as a majority stick to the biblical description of the earth. Understood. Understood. Uh, yes, and Dr. Bob believes that the dome is gone. Um, so basically his, his model had the firmament made out of uh, metallic hydrogen and that, um, the eruption of the fountains of the great deep at the time of the flood, uh, melted it basically. And that was pretty much the only thing that could destroy it. And that is what brought it down. Um, because once that's brought down, then, um, there's, because the metallic hydrogen has a bunch of very strange characteristics, which is interesting when you talk about Jupiter, by the way. Um, but we'll get into that later because we're already 40 minutes in. Jeez, dude, we got to get moving. Um, okay. Are you going to go plans? <laughs> no, no. It's just... Uh, Good to live Okay. And uh, Breaking Bad, like number four, uh, or Breaking Babylon. Uh, I can hear uh, yeah, seeing the map showing land beyond Antarctica. You've seen a map? Showing land beyond Antarctica. Interesting. I, w I had not heard that before. Okay, so there we have it. Now, do, do you guys mind, do you guys feel, those of you who, who like the dome model or believe the dome model, do you feel that's a critical part of your model? Let me put it another way. If, that, if we just ignored that dome and focused on the flat earth portion, would that make or break your model? Would it make or break your model if that dome wasn't there? I don't think it would. I think you could still determine whether Earth was flat or a sphere, with or without the dome. Um, anyway, that, that's kind of what I was getting at. Uh, the map showing the land beyond Antarctica. Okay, thank you for that. So I guess, uh, I guess let me ask you that. Are you okay if we ignore the dome? I'd, I'd like to do that just to simpl simplify the discussion because I mean we could probably we could probably spend two hours just talking about the firmament and the dome and discussing all that. And I don't think it's really applicable to the flat Earth or a globe Earth model. So is that fair? I'm going to go on like it's fair. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go to. Questions from the chats. What I want to... Okay, Breaking Babylon says we can ignore the dome. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to questions from the chat. 
So where do you guys want us to go first? What do you guys want to discuss first? So I got a suggested list. We can go uh, from what the Bible's the Bible says. The Bible says the earth is flat. A lot of people claim that. Uh, I can't see the curvature. That's probably, in fact, Breaking Babylon brought that up uh, even before we started. That's probably the most common question uh, I've encountered. Can't see the curvature. Uh, experiments you can do at home. That's another one. Satellites is another one. Uh, the International Space Station is fake. That's another one we can go to. Photos of the Earth are fake. Uh, these are all suggested topics. Or if there's one that you would like to address, uh, throw, it out, throw it on the chats and let us... Uh, personally, I think firmament should have been translated as expanse. Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's complicated because there's actually, like Dr. Walt Brown has contended that there's actually two firmaments. One is the crust of the earth and the other is this firmament in, you know, surrounding the earth or surrounding the universe, whichever one you want to argue. And again, I don't necessarily believe that, but he had some really good arguments for that. Uh, so it's, it's quite, it's, it's complicated. Like I said, we could spend a lot of time just discussing that and we we're here for the flat earth. Uh, so Let's juxtapose Isaiah 40, 22 and Isaiah 22, 18 regarding circle and ball. Okay, personally, I think expanse. Let me just one. Hi, Ian. Do you believe in the flat earth? I don't, um, but I have a lot of friends who do, and some of them are here. One of the firmament verses in Genesis with water above and water below refers to the land masses, terra firma. Bob Enyart goes into a good deal. A good detail on Walt Brown's hydroplate theory. Yes, uh, they he goes into that a lot. Yes. Okay. Um, Al, do you have a pre preference? Nobody seems to have a preference. Oh, I didn't know you were putting me on the spot here. I could. Oh, I. Oh, I. Could, I'm chomping <laughs> at the bit. So, I. I, okay. I know what I want to talk about. <laughs> well, there, there are many. And let's start with the space station. The space station. Okay. Yep. Okay, so the ISS is fake. This is a common one. Um, what I'm going to show you guys here, uh, first I will show you is the pictures. I actually took pictures of the International Space Station just the other day, and uh, this is something you guys can do at home. And you'll notice that everything, uh, almost everything I do today, uh, I'm specifically trying to leave NASA out of the picture. You don't trust them? That's okay. We're not going to use GPS. We're not going to use NASA. We're going to try and use technology available to us that we can back up or verify ourselves from home as much as possible. Now, you still have to, in this particular case, um, you still need to uh, look up the numbers. There's one picture. That's not the picture I'm looking for. Where did my picture go? I'm proud of that picture. I want to show you guys that picture. Oh, I'm so sad, Al. I can't find my picture. I have too many images and stuff. And Well, we could jump to a different topic. No! Go back to ISS. <laughs> no! <laughs> I want... Okay, well, I mean, this is... The, the, this is one, but it's not, uh, you know what? Okay, one second. Um, give me one second, folks. I will find this. I thought I copied it over into the other folder. I, apparently, I did not. Core, core. Auto. So while you're looking for it, I can talk about, there's a local photographer here where I live who okay. recently on one of his uh, social media sites posted a picture of the ISS. And uh, he used a mapping system, an app, to uh, be able to track where it's going to be and when it's going to be present in the skies and so on. So he focused his telescope, and it's very clear in the image, and it's his image from his telescope camera. It isn't one that he, you know, downloaded from online. He has a motorized telescope and everything else. It was very clear for me. It's it's you would have to. What would you have to do to falsify that live image? What would what would be the parameters? I think it'd be astronomical. Well, and, well, and let's take it one step farther. Let's show everybody how they can do that for themselves. <laughs> because uh, 
Um, so, so oh, I'll, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I thought you were saying something. Um, nope. Okay, I will share the screen so you can see this as well. Even though you've seen to this. Give me some time to see if you get to. Okay. Yeah, you're buffering bad now. So my camera's dying and you're buffering. Ah, oh, makes me sad. Okay, so this was a picture I took the other night. There is the International Space Station right there. You can see the solar panels, the main body, the other solar array, which is on an angle to the first one. This uh, passed in front of the moon from about here to here. It took about 1.3 seconds. Uh, I was actually videotaping it. And so I'm going to show you how you can do this yourself. Um, and I'll give you a couple of tips as well to make it better. First of all, turn up your frame rate. Uh, I had my frame rate way too low. This was only the second time I attempted this. The first time I attempted this was uh, back in 2019, and this is in front of the sun. So even here, you can still, in my horrible pixels, um, you can still make out details and I actually saw this on the screen when it passed. And I, I thought it was an insect at first, had flown in front of the lens, because I saw it. It was just for a fleeting second. Um, and uh, this is actually taken through a piece of aluminum foil. <laughs> so it's not exactly optical grade, to say the least, okay? And uh, I just have my video camera looking through, you know, those Mylar emergency blankets. That's, that's what I use for my solar viewers. If I want to take a picture of the sun or look at the sun, I just look through a layer of that. And that's what I did here. And it's not exactly optical grade. And I had never done this before. So I didn't know. I didn't even know if I was going to catch it or not. And I did. I caught it for two frames, actually. Uh, whoops. That was... But it looks like you could, it looks like you could almost make out the solar arrays. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. And unfortunately, I had a hard drive crash right. and I lost all my original images as well. Um, so these are downloaded off Facebook. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's already grainy and pixelated and not very nice. And then uh, to boot, Facebook butchered it. So this one's still much better. Um, and I turned up the contrast so you could see it better. But uh, so here's how you do this. So there is, if you go to, ISS, and by the way, this is in the references. Uh, so I have the references in the comments or in the description and uh, with a direct link to this. So transit-finder.com. And you can go there and you can punch in your latitude and longitude. And uh, I've already punched it in for my, this is actually not my place. This is actually close. Uh, but let's, well, let's do a run. So calculate. I set it to 80 kilometers drive maximum. So there's going to be the ISS, uh, a moon close pass. Uh, ISS again, ISS again. Okay, this one looks pretty good. This is going to be a sun close pass. That's the ISS. I don't see the Chinese space station here. So the Chinese space station will also show up in the predictions, right? Uh, so once you find one that's pretty close, uh, that's, that's pretty close. And you could probably be able to see that even in front of the darkened moon. So when you take a look at the map, it will show you where the path of that pass will be. Right. And so, uh, I'm over, where are we here? Give me one second. Okay, so this is way up at Bissett Creek again. So let's go down here, Deep River. Ooh, Petawawa and Pember. Oh, look at this. Oh, Chalk River, my hometown. I could take a short drive to Petawawa. So here, let's go. I'm right on the highway here in Petawawa. I'm going to double click there and recalculate for that location. And notice it's going to go right through the smack, smack dab through the middle of the moon. If I just take a short drive, it's only about a oh, 12 kilometer drive. And I can now set up my camera in advance. Um, the first time I did a looter transit, it was about a minute and 30 seconds early. And the one the other night was about 35 seconds late uh, on the predicted time. But that will be pretty close. And you can set up your camera on a tripod. Uh, zoom If you've got a better zoom than I had, which the zoom on my camera isn't the greatest. 
Uh, I miss my good Zooms. Oh, makes me sad. But anyway, um, so anyway, that's how you can do that. And so right there with that alone. So that was only my second attempt at photographing and videotaping the ISS. So if you turn up your shutter speed, which I should have done, uh, as it was, I had to turn down the iris because the moon was too bright. It was perfect. It was a full moon. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was perfect. Um, I was a little limited because the moon was low on the horizon and there was only so many places I could set up my camera and still be able to see the moon and I didn't have trees on the road, right? Um, so that kind of limited it a little bit. But what I should have done was turned up the shutter speed so that it was taking a picture slower because you get these weird, um, not beat notes, but uh, uh, you get the rolling shutter effect. And so those solar panels, it literally looks like it's flipping, like it's rolling. Um, it's not. It's just the way the scan lines in the video were operating. If you turn your shutter speed up, that deals with that. That gets rid of that. Because that thing goes across the camera like whoosh, that fast. It's gone. Um, and I didn't get to see it in advance either. So, uh, okay. I'm just going to go to the comments real quick. Very hard for me to tell me. It's just the sun and the moon around, so why not Earth? Okay. Would like the air pressure with altitude topic covered. Oh, yes. Okay. That's a good one. Why does air pressure reduce with altitude? Very good. Very good question. My son James hit the space station with your directional antenna, and he has to follow it across the sky. Okay. Now, I didn't, I haven't gotten into that yet. Uh, satellites, you can uh, capture imagery straight off low Earth orbiting satellites from home. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, we have caught them using chroma key to fake the ISS interior shots. I'm going to say, I'm going to say sure. Why not? Um, that has nothing to do with whether the ISS is up there or not. Um, and, and I think you would agree with that, right? So the question here is because that, I, that space station or whatever it is, um, you can follow that track. And in about 35 minutes, it's going to pass over Australia. So if I got a friend in Australia, okay, go outside. Hopefully, you know, it's dark enough that they can see as well. If you time it properly, you can probably see that same craft pass over Australia. And oftentimes, depending on the orbit, it'll be from the south. So in the flat earth model, this is now coming from outside the perimeter of the flat earth. Um, and the same with the weather satellites, which again, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit here. Um, matter of fact, I think that was next on the list. No, my Eric tossed the knees experiment experiment. Yes. Um, this is, this is one of my favorite weather. Okay. So yeah, yeah. The, we, we did this yesterday. Okay. So Eratosthenes, we over, we went over the experiment. So what we did yesterday is we replicated Eratosthenes experiment and I'm going to go in Google earth. I know, I know I'm using Google earth. I'm just using Google earth for reference. I'm not going to use it for anything um, other than that. So what we did, I had two friends help me out here who hopefully are in the chat, uh, David and Neil. So Neil is way out in Ross Haven, Alberta, right there. And my buddy Dave is down in Glen Rose, Texas. And I'm way up here in the thriving metropolis of Chalk River, Ontario. And the reason I chose these three locations is because, A, I had two solid guys who, were, who I already knew were well capable of doing what I needed them to do. The second reason is because I have driven to these locations multiple times. And so I can use the trusty odometer on my vehicle. I no longer have to rely on GPS. I no longer have to rely on anything NASA has produced. I can go by the odometer of my vehicle, which I know is going to be at least reasonably accurate. Uh, but let's say it's off by 10%, which is a lot. But let's say it's off by 10%. That's still well within the margin of error. We can still make use of this. What we did is we... 
I had them, uh, Niels, you can hardly see it, but there's his stick there. Basically, there's my stick. All I did was I had them put a stick in the ground, make sure it was perfectly vertical, either with a level level or a plumb bob, or, uh, and, and photograph the, show, the shadow generated by the stick and with a compass heading so we can use the north heading, the magnetic north heading, for reference point. So that's all we did. And we literally had a three-way call. Now, Dave's set up, you can see it's pretty dark here. You can barely see a shadow from his tripod because he had heavy cloud cover. And he literally <laughs> he was like, we're on the phone on a three-way call. And he's like, oh, the sun's coming through the clouds. Quick, take a picture. No, no, no. So we're all taking a picture at that exact moment. We took our pictures within seconds of each other. So now you can see Neil's shadow here. So... uh there's Neil's compass. By the way, look at this. I don't know how well you can see this because it's a pretty grainy picture. See the red needle on the compass? So I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to do all the math and everything. Like, Neil, something's wrong here. I think the compass is backwards. He's like, oh yeah, it is. Manufacturer's defect. They painted the south point black or red and the north point black. I'm like, what? I've never, what? Who does that? Anyway. So we, we, we figured it out anyway. Uh, so now what we have is we have a the height of the post, the length of the shadow, the angle of the shadow relative to the bearing, uh, uh, the north bearing, and we have it on three different locations that are thousands of kilometers apart. And what I did was I then brought them into Blender 3D. Uh, so Blender, this you can do all this from home, and I strongly encourage you guys to do this uh, because, first of all, it's fun. Secondly, it's science. It's cool. You can do it from home. You can do it with your friends. And um, you can see here, I've got the map. I marked on the map overlay just the three red dots approximately where we were just to make it easier to place the vectors because now all I'm going to do is in Blender 3D, which is a free program, that you can download and use. And by the way, uh, this Blender file that I'm sharing with you right now is available in the downloads on Dropbox. I've got the link in the description. And uh, so the, the link is in the description. You can download this and take a look at it yourself. So here's the three points. And all I'm doing now is I'm just tracing the vectors of the rays of sun is all I did. And you can see these bars here. So like, here's, here's the red bar. You've got the, the ray tracing and then this red bar attached to it. That is the North vector. And I'll show you how I did that in just a second, but I use those so that I, I lock these two together and then I can rotate them together to align the ray trace with the North pole. And so as you can see here, the rays don't even come close. Like they, they never align. Can you see that Al? And, uh, I can see it. Yep. okay. Yep. And, Pretty um, weird. and, uh, I, I hope you guys can see this because and I know in the live stream, it's going to kind of glitch everything. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, but the, so you pretty much have to do this in a 3d program or alternatively, you could literally build your own flat earth model it's in like real life and build these vectors and everything and just do it in real life. Now let's take those exact same vectors and put them on a globe earth. So these are to scale. So that is, uh, you can see the scale up here, 45. So I've got it, uh, one meter equals about a thousand meters or a uh, thousand kilometers. Sorry. So that's the radius, which is basically the circumference of the earth. And you can see the globe here. I've got it. Uh, that's the radius, by the way, not the diameter. So the radius is 12,700 12, kilometers. And when you put them on the globe, there's a little bit of error, but you can see they're basically pointing straight out from the surface all at a very, very distant point. So this is, this is very, very clear uh, proof 
that the sun is very, very far away. Uh, now, you want to put numbers on it? Well, I don't know. But uh, if I were to say, let's take a look at the flat Earth map for a second. Um, let's say we've got some error here, and this one actually crosses this one right here. Well, I've already measured it. Uh, let's see, not that one, this one here. So let's say that that pinpoints the sun at that elevation. Um, that would be uh, 1,300 kilometers. So uh, did I get that? Am I looking at the right one? Oh, nope. 2,600, sorry. 2,600 kilometers. So literally, I've driven farther across Canada than the, than the altitude of the sun would be on that one. If you want to go to this one, even though the lines don't cross, let's say they do. Let's say that, whoops. Let's say there's error, error there in our measurements, because they were pretty crude. I agree. Um, even then, oh, I got to select it. That's why. Uh, this would only be, this would be less than 10,000 kilometers. So literally, I've driven farther in Canada than the altitude of that the sun would be there. Literally. So this is all downloadable. Um, you guys can download it off Dropbox, and I'll show you what I did here. So you can replicate this. First of all, you got to get a couple of friends. The farther apart you are, the better. And you can see I made how I made the vectors here. All I did was I took, here's my dummy vector, and it's got three parts. The ray trace part, the polar north part, which right now is line, aligned with the Y axis in Blender, and then this nub, which has the rotational point in the bottom, and that is 12.7 meters for the radius of the globe. Because now, if you take a look in here, I'll put on wireframe so you can see, you can see all of those, let me ditch this guy, all three of the ray traces are centered in the center of the globe. And I had to do that in order to keep the north and the ray perpendicular to the tangent of the surface of the earth there. All right. So that's why. So then all you do is you put it in place and line up the north arm with the north pole. Now you know it's aligned. It's also aligned with the center of the globe. And that's how I got those. So. That's all downloadable. Um, you know, that's pretty compelling, Ian. Um, <laughs> I didn't see this, by the way, for those watching. This is the first time I see this experiment. Um, <laughs> and things that Ian was saying that you could do from home. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. I don't even know what to say. It's, that's yeah. really impressive. Yeah, it, it, it turned out better than I thought it would, um, to be honest. Um, whoops. Got to stop sharing. There we go. Uh, That's amazing. Yes. Okay. So we, and we, we did have fun with that and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Neil and Dave. If you're on here, thank you very much. Uh, the, because they, these guys did a bang up job. Um, I did have to take magnetic deviation into account, by the way. Um, it, it was, it was not as good and the magnetic deviation, some might object to that. Um, but let's stop again. This is stuff you can do at home. I can go into my backyard year after year and I can look at my compass and say, okay, it points north here right now. Come back a year later, okay, it points here now. And come back year after year after year and you can see again for yourself, document it, you can see the magnetic north deviates. And so there's actually maps where people, that's their job. They, take, they keep track of that, right? So you had to take that into account. In Neil's location, so to give you an idea, Neil's location was uh, plus 14 degrees to the west, uh, and mine was negative 12. So that's how, that's how big a difference it was, right? Dave's position was plus 3. So it, it is a significant difference you, have to do you do have to take into account. Um, okay, so anyway, was that. Uh, okay, let's go to the chats. I was going to say, do we have any questions on that or any chats? Coming through. Uh, it says nothing to do with there being no curve. Okay, so the I, uh, Breaking Babylon is just mentioning, you know, the ISS has nothing to do with there being a curve. I would disagree for a few reasons. Number one, it's in orbit. Um, if it's in orbit and it goes 
around on one side of the planet and comes from the south in Australia, then in your flat earth model, whoops, how does that work? Because you've got a satellite going, say, this direction. Where's it? It's going this way. I watched it. I tracked it. And now suddenly it's coming up over here. How does that work? If it's a polar orbiting satellite, it works on a globe Earth. It doesn't work on, on a flat Earth, right? So that, that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, I was going to as well go to when we were discussing satellites. Oh, and there's the Blender file there, guys. Uh, so the link is in the description of the video. I did put it in so the, the link is there and you can download that file yourself and play with it or modify it with your own, uh, you know, if you, if you do, and I do think you should, um, you, if you get uh, a couple of friends or even one other friend. So this is taking Eratosthenes' experiment, but taking it to the max, <laughs> right? And we're doing stuff that he could not do or, you know, whatever. Um, okay, let me see if I get... Well, I think the important thing is just taking a step back and talking about what you mentioned right at the very onset of this uh, podcast is these are experiments you can do from home. You can do it yourself. You can do it with, with friends. You can do it with probably most of the equipment you already have in your home or garage, right? Yep. Yep. And the price of gas. Uh, the reason I emphasized uh, that I drove to these locations, because if you're suspicious of NASA, all right, I, I'm okay with that. No GPS involved. Mm -hmm. I'm not using Google Earth. I'm not using Google Maps. I'm use, I was using old printed maps because all, all those, most of those drives were before the days of MapQuest, <laughs> you know? Um, so, I mean, I'm using paper maps and I can verify that my odometer more or less matched what was on the map. So that's how I was able to mm -hmm. verify myself Without any NASA involvement, um, I follow this map, and it takes me that distance to get to Glen Rose, and I made that trip many, many times. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the days of MapQuest, the starter days, I did a trip down there with a couple of friends, and it took we took a different route. We went through Niagara Falls instead of through Detroit, and it added hours to the trip, hours. The, this was not a small difference. Yeah. And and it was Neil, actually, the guy that it went down with, who pointed out, oh, well, it was because of the curvature of the Earth. And that's what it was. Because when you're looking at a flat map, you're like, oh, well, this is the most direct route. Clearly, we should go that way. <laughs> but no, it was because you had to go pretty much predominantly west first, then Maybe. south. Um, anyway, uh, so Maybe with... With... Uh, with... Um, regards to satellites. So again, here's something else you can do at home. And I strongly encourage it. I'll share it with you. So you get to see this too, Al. <laughs> so uh, you can go outside and you can watch satellites pass overhead. So, uh, okay, we've been out of this for an hour and 10 minutes. Okay, we're not doing too bad for time. We did say we'd keep it under five hours, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, it was also a lot of the people viewing it. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So you can watch satellites go across the sky. And like I said, you can track them. You can use that. Uh, there's tons of predictors out there. All you need is the satellite data. And you can do one of two things. You can do what I did here and just track it across the sky. This, this is just a random satellite that I sampled. It passed about 153 degrees of view from when it first appeared and when it disappeared. So that's, and it took about seven minutes and 25 seconds to make that pass. Mm -hmm. Now, I brought this up with a flat earth friend of mine oh, like 10 years ago, and I brought up weather satellites because you can pick these up, uh, which I'll explain in a second. You can pick up the signals from these at home with a $30 piece of gear you can order offline. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a USB radio is what it is. And you can connect it to your computer and you can download and capture images straight off that weather satellite going over your house live from the satellite. Or you can stand outside, watch it pass overhead, 
and you can predict where it's going. And you can have a friend on another part of the planet who can also keep an eye open for that satellite because now it's going to go over their house because it is a globe Earth and it's polar orbiting satellites. So it's so as the Earth rotates underneath the orbit of the satellite, um, it'll now pass over a different country very shortly. So uh, in my case, now, when I brought all this up with my friend, he... Um, Oh, I have to stop the sharing. There we go. Uh, I, I brought all this up and I explained it to him. I, I, I even showed him, you know, here, you can get an SDR dongle, uh, software, de a software derived radio, um, or defined radio, sorry. And you can hook it up to an antenna and you just look up the schedule for when the satellite's going overhead. You can be downloading inside. And if it's nighttime, you can go outside and you can watch the satellite go overhead. Mm -hmm. And I brought all this up and I said, now it's going to go over Australia. And he, his response was just simply, oh, well, that's just weather balloons. Um, it was very frustrating because I spent a lot of time um, explaining it in simple manners. And he just wrote it all off with a non-answer. Uh, first of all, if it's a weather balloon, I can take a picture of it. I mean, do we, do we, have we forgotten about the Chinese spy balloon? That was 20 kilometers up. <laughs> the memes. Oh, I got to send Xi Jinping a thank you card, man. That was awesome. Oh, do you want to, do you want to see the memes? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. We got to, we got to, we got to, oh, no, no, we no. We three and a half hours to go do it. Let's see if we do it. Let's, <laughs> we might as well entertain at the same time. Right? Yes, yes. That's right. <laughs> Yes, yes, the the Chinese weather Let's balloon, the Chinese spy balloon. Yes. Oh, well, I'll share it with you so you can see it. I've seen a few that are pretty. Well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, you can you can see him again. But anyway, the Chinese the Chinese spy balloon. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> weather balloon, totally not for spying. <laughs> this one, if you know anything about U.S. politics, that was funny. Man, that was funny. That's hilarious. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Department of Defense, yeah, who did absolutely nothing. Yep. Well, they sent a U2 plane up to it eventually. Yeah, Wolverines, yes. Anyway, okay. You guys are getting me off on tangents. Okay, so <laughs> coming back to the satellites. Okay, so let's say it is a weather balloon. And let's say it's a ridiculous altitude, like uh, 40, uh, 40 kilometers up. Okay, well, we can triangulate this. Okay, so we just break it down into triangles. If we put a right angle triangle here, I know that, you know, because it was 153 degrees total, I just split it in half. I've got two triangles split in half, 76.5 degrees. And so that craft, whatever it was, transited the sky transited 153 degrees of the sky in seven minutes and 25 seconds. If that is at 40 kilometers altitude, then it's simple triangulation. You know that that side of the triangle is 166.6 kilometers. That one is also, so for a grand total of 332, 33.2 kilometers in seven minutes and 25 seconds. That means it was at an average speed of 2,695 kilometers an hour. Look, to give you an idea, the speed of sound, that's 2.2 Mach. Weather balloons or any kind of balloon does not travel at Mach 2.2. Uh, there's only two jet fighters I know of in the planet that'll go faster than that. And most of the jet fighters will not go that fast. They can't even keep up with it. So that's if it's a 40 kilometers. Which, again, bear in mind, if it's any lower, you can take, take pictures of it. You can look at it and see, oh, that's not a balloon. But let's say it's 30 kilometers. Well, then the math works out to 2,000, a little over 2,000 kilometers an hour. Still supersonic. Still almost Mach 2. Uh, even at 20 kilometers, the same altitude as the, the Chinese weather uh, <laughs> weather balloon. <laughs> um, even there it's still at that altitude, it would still have to go 1300. It'd still have to fly supersonic in order to cover that much of the sky 
in that short a time frame, right? So th these are all just frankly impossible things um, that absolutely rules out. It rules out balloons. They're satellites. That's what they are. And they are in orbit around a globe Earth. Um, now, uh, uh, Breaking Babylon, before we even started, um, was saying, show me the curvature of the Earth. Again, here's something you can do. If, you're, if you've got a, even a small budget, and this is something I'll be doing, um, which, oh, this reminds me. Okay, I'm going to show you how to do this at home, okay? So there's a, a kid on YouTube, and he's just a kid. Uh, but you can launch high-altitude balloons from home. For under 200 bucks, uh, you, you would probably have to put in a note, a nodum, a notice to airmen, um, to let them know you're flying a high altitude balloon. But this guy, this kid flew his balloon up to a hundred thousand feet. And, um, someone mentioned, uh, the, the atmospheric density changes or pressure. And that is because basically, the reason you have air pressure is because you've got all this air stacked on top of it, gravity pulling it down. And so the, the higher you go, the less air you have stacked on top. Think of it that way. Um, the same, the same idea as when you swim, you go, you only get down, go down 10 feet and your ears are already popping for the pressure. It's because you've got water stacked on top of you. It, air is a fluid. So it's the exact same principle. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because many people, including Breaking Babylon, that was his first question, show me the curve. And that, in fact, that is probably the most common question I get. If you show them pictures from uh, high altitude balloons or uh, 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 what was his name? Baumgartner, the jump from the... Mm -hmm. the yep. Yeah, yeah, which... Oh, dude, that was intense. Oh, I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> The whole yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, funny, it's funny you bring that one up because I just watched that one up, up three or four days ago again. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Yep, yep. So, I mean, or you show them that one, the the typical response is, oh, it's a fisheye lens, which, which is true. And yes, it does add a curve. However, there's a catch here. You cannot use that as uh, to write it off. And here's why. So I'm going to show you uh, screen captures. So the, the link for this video is, again, down in the description. And what I did was I grabbed screen captures. So here's the altitude down here. So he's you know only like 10,000 feet at this point. Unfortunately, when he launched, it was there was several layers of cloud cover. But notice, so remember, this is a camera take and taking a picture at about 10,000 feet. There is no curve visible, even in spite of the clouds. Um, now, okay, we're up here uh, 35,000 feet, and there's a slight bit more curve. You're starting to see the curve. You have to get very high in order to be able to see the curve. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it's the same camera. Do you follow me there? Okay, so... If it's not showing a curve at lower elevations, but it is at higher elevations, you can't say, oh, it's just the fisheye lens. I'm using the same camera, the same lens. So it's just at different altitudes. So, and this one here uh, is a slight curve, but not much. Um, now we're getting up there. This is just before the balloon burst. And by the way, that's, that's how they're designed. Um, so if you do this from home, it's... Uh, between 50 and 100 bucks, depending on the balloon you get. But they're actually calibrated to burst, and you actually program into the... Uh, you program into the, uh, into the computer what altitude you want it to burst at, and it spits out numbers. You tell it what kind of balloon you've got and, it, and how much your payload is. And uh, th this kid at FLA on YouTube, uh, he goes through all this and he explained how he did it. Did it very well, by the way. Um, so it will spit out numbers and all you do is you pump the balloon up to a very specific pressure at the neck. That's how you know, and they're very precisely made, so it will literally burst from uh, the lack of pressure at altitude. It expands so big that it literally bursts and you have a parachute that brings your payload down at that point. 
So again, you can do this at home. Uh, total cost, maybe 200 bucks. That's assuming you have a GoPro or something, you know. Um, so do this. If you don't like the fisheye lens, stick your own camera on. I don't care. You're still going to see the curve. <laughs> so, you know, this is touching on the curvature of the earth. I've, I've mm -hmm. seen a couple of uh, uh, a couple of videos on this, and one one person in particular, I can't remember his name, he's got a great great handle uh, name on Globy McGlobe Face or something like this. But anyway, <laughs> that's he said, awesome. let's, yeah, Globy McGlobe Face, I think it is. Anyway, he's talking about uh, let's take away the globe earth for just a moment mm -hmm. and let's go with the flat earth. He says, even on a flat earth, if you start going up, at some point it will show a curvature, especially if you're not, if your point of departure is not the center. You go off in any area and you move up, you will see a curvature. That's and a good point. Be, yeah, so he says, basically, let's do a really crude analogy for an experiment. He says, take a pipeline, take a, a, take a, take a plate from your cupboard and basically look straight at it but as you go up and as you go up or as you tilt the plate in any direction it'll show a curvature even right. on a flat earth even if it were true and and the accurate model it will still show a curvature okay that's an interesting point i hadn't I uh it was interesting. yeah yeah um okay so let uh let's take this up a little bit higher uh, I'm going to share it so you can see it again. Is it past your bedtime yet, Al? No, Jim. Okay. <laughs> it's getting close to my bedtime, but hey. So, okay, here we are. Where, uh, so his balloon burst at, I think, 37,000. This is mm -hmm. just before it burst. And you can start to see the curve there. There is a definite curve there. And so this was the same camera just shot at different elevations. So here's the second camera he had on board. This is like a little satellite sculpture he'd made that he just had in the camera. Unfortunately here, it's cloudy at low altitude. You can't really see anything. He could starting to break through the clouds. There's no curve there at uh, lower altitudes. Getting up there, still no curve. Again, same camera. Uh, yeah, I doubt you guys could even see that, but you can just barely see a break in the clouds there. Um, but on a live stream, I doubt you'll even see that. But this video, what he did, he put the entire flight on video on YouTube. That's where I got all these from. So you can go and take a look at it yourself. Um, you can start to see the curve here a little bit. And it's about the same there. It's a weak curve, but the curve is there. And it's getting stronger. This is just before it burst. And there is a definite just, curve there. Just yep. looking at that picture, it, 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 these are the, this is the very first time I see these images. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not privy to anything that you're showing right now until you show it. Uh, right off the top, first thing that triggers is if that were a fisheye lens, it would actually distort the camera as well in the image. It does not. Right, right, right. Um, now, Beans is saying it would be helpful to add a straight line on the screen. I agree. And you know what? Maybe you guys should do this, and you can put a straight line on the screen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm trying to see the curve. is even at high altitude balloons. The curve is virtually undetectable. This can be tested in 3D software. I agree. Uh, horizon always rises to, the, to eye level and always looks flat. Horizon equals horizontal. Uh, whoops. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is stuff you can do at home. Ignore that. <laughs> okay. It's 25 after. Oh, uh, uh, Rosthenes, Eratosthenes. I always do the wrong one. Um, hey, do you want to talk about the Bible stuff? We can. That's almost a, uh, that's almost a. A whole segment in itself, uh, but we could touch base on it. Maybe do a follow-up podcast. You want to do that? Uh, what I have is pretty extensive. <laughs> but you know what? We we may have to because I mean I've, yeah. I'm just looking at the list here. I have still haven't gone to uh, the midnight land of the midnight sun, both the Arctic and Antarctic. 
Uh, haven't talked about geostationary satellites. Haven't talked about gravity and constant acceleration, which is a fun one because, as some of you will know, I have unconventional views on gravity. Uh, you know, my, by the way, my other my other video uh, that it, the follow up uh, anti gravity experiments I did. Did did you see that? No. Hundred thousand views in a month. So, it's like it ramped up the first video to like 70,000 views, right? So, I mean, I, I have unconventional views of gravity, right? So, um, I, I so addressing the gravity constant and the gravity issue in a flat earth is, is important, but even with my unconventional views, um, which may or may not be right, uh, you've still got an issue either way, but uh, regardless. Um, so, tell you what, guys. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, we, could, we could quickly touch base on it, but I think it's a topic that is going to, it's going to take another full segment, another full podcast. Okay, so uh, let's let's ask you guys in the chats then, what would you like to do? Would you like to, uh, do you want to go over a couple of Bible verses right now, or do you want to do maybe a follow-up live stream at some point? Uh, we could... What's what's your schedule like next Friday, there, uh, Al? I'll make it good happen. Okay, so we could do it again next Friday. Um, have plenty of caffeinated drinks ready for the marathon. Yeah, I mean, me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unconventional, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely unconventional. Uh, haven't talked about rail guns or infrared cameras, gigapixel photos, or why we can see so far. Okay, yeah, and that's uh, that's another one too. That's on the list, which I haven't gotten into. Why we can see so far? Um, that's right. that's actually a fun topic. Uh, I can go yeah, on for a very really long is. time just on that topic. <laughs> Again, with experiments you could do at home. Um, yeah. So, but I think this is one that uh, definitely has a lot of interest. Um, I, I, I would say let's uh, let's book it for next Friday. Let's do it again. Maybe we get to. Okay. Uh, finish off some of the experiments, some of the observations, and then we can go into the biblical side of it and look at some of the scriptures that uh, both sides use and uh, analyze them and break them down. Okay. Um, tell you what, because I was talking about satellites and balloons, I'll show you one last thing and then we'll close off for the night. How about that? Sounds good. Uh, and again, I apologize for the crummy photos. Um, because again, with my hard drive crash, I apparently lost the originals, uh, which disappoints me because uh, I didn't get a chance to go and get more photos like these. Oh, maybe I could do that. If we're going to do this again next week, you know what? Maybe I'll just go and reshoot some photos. Uh, but um, you know what? Yes, let's let's do this. I will explain to you guys how you can do this from home. And maybe some of you guys will do it this week. And maybe you could share your photos with us. So, as you can see here, uh, this is just a photograph of the night sky. All I did was I put my camera on a tripod, locked it down, and I locked it down. Uh, I'll put it back on me for a second here so I can show you so I can talk to you with my hands um, just my poor camera died oh poor thing um, so anyway you need a, a, a semi-decent uh, camera one that you can keep the shutter open uh, and preferably manually focus because that can be a little tricky uh, on my Canon which I don't have here I have a Canon DSLR and uh, so I was able to manually focus that uh, on the stars. Uh, so I was able to get this shot. So basically, put it in your tripod. This axis, you want to point it, orient it so it's pointed straight at the North Pole. That's all you care about. And as long as it's pointing to a dark patch in the sky, that's all you care about. What you want to do now is you want to lock it down, leave it, open the shutter, and let it run for at least 10 minutes. Uh, the longer, the better. Um, but this is what you will get. Because I am looking, basically, I am looking out 
at the equator. And so the stars, because the stars are moving, they generate streaks in the images. However, on the equator are geosynchronous satellites. And they're very, very faint. But if you've got your shutter open for 10 minutes, look at them all. There's bunches of them here. There's a group of three right there. There's another two right there. There's one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. They are orbiting in synchronization with the Earth. And so they don't move. So they sit there in the field of view of the camera and just get uh, generate a brighter and brighter spot. There's another one down there, another one down there. And they're typically all along the equatorial plane, if you will. And so they rotate in time with Earth, which is why all the stars blur into lines, but the geostationary satellites do not. They appear stationary in the sky because they are rotating at the same speed that the globe Earth is spinning. So that was one image I got. Here was another one. This was my second attempt, and they really started coming out at this point. Uh, I, I remember also uh, there was a lot of northern lights that night. Uh, which was kind of blinding things. So they had died down a little bit here. But you can start to see all these constellations of geostationary satellites that come out when you stick the camera uh, locked down on a tripod for a long period of time. The longer, the better. And uh, you will start to see all the geostationary satellites showing up as bright spots in the, in the picture while all the stars mm -hmm. streak. So anyway, there, there's another, so that's another experiment you just can do from home. So if you got a somewhat decent camera, so, um, long exposure shots of Polaris, the Southern cross, uh, we could, um, I agree. We could do a whole series on these, <laughs> but we also want to get to, uh, well, we want to get to other controversial topics. Like the global warming, which, man, you know how expensive those aerosol cans out there? I'm out there every day with two aerosol cans saluting, <laughs> trying to increase global warming, and I'm not sure it's working. Those things are expensive. But anyway, yeah. we, we want global warming here. But it is one topic that would be nice to talk about. I don't think we need to delve too much into it. I think maybe one more podcast, let's close it off. Yep. Move on to the next one. Okay. Yeah. And maybe I'll have a working camera by then. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to call this off for the night. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate that. And for the comments and questions as well. Uh, so I'll, well, well, you can come back to the same link, uh, rumble.com slash user slash Ian Juby slash live. That will take you to whatever live stream is going on at that time. And uh, we'll try and arrange another uh, another podcast, see what happens. Um, anyway, you got anything else to say? We got no, I think that's it. I mean, what, okay. uh, what you presented, I, I was pretty impressed. I was taken back because I wasn't sure what to expect. Right. So I was, uh, I was equally surprised as I'm sure everybody else was. Uh, pleasantly surprised uh, mm -hmm. at the experiments. So thanks okay. for taking the time to you, as always. Okay. Right on. All right. Well, everyone, everyone, have a good night. God bless, and we'll see you all on the flip side. We're signing off.